we just waiting for uh, Dom from the Dog Brigade to join us? Hope you're all having a good morning Tuesday. Hello. Hello. Where are you? Yay. I didn't factor in that this was going to cut my uh, camera in half. <laughs> I feel like the Brady Bunch <laughs> movie. <laughs> Good night, Dom. <laughs> <laughs> Masha, Masha, Masha. <laughs> Oh, how's your Tuesday, mate? Yeah, good. Survived it. Another day in lockdown-ish. Yeah. You? Yeah. I'm, I've been at this, at this desk all day. Um, been good, though. Got lots done. Um, yeah. Looking forward to this what? one. I'm looking forward to today, this chat. Um, what are we talking about, Ed? Talking about dominance. Uh, and... <gasps> debunking it a little um it's obviously still really part of like common popular culture and i wish i didn't have to keep talking about it but the fact that it's still out there means that we're gonna have to keep bringing it up how it's a load of bullshit until it's common knowledge that it's a load of bullshit <laughs> yeah it, it, it's a bit unfortunate that it's 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 um Oh, what's the best way? The shit that just won't sink. Um, people will still use it. It's still used in training, um, and it's it, it's 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 unfair to the dogs in the end. Um, but it's also unfair to to unknowing dog owners who are getting this information and then. Sometimes putting it into practice, but really not what they're doing. Yeah, well, yeah, anyone teaching it doesn't really know what they're doing. Um, it's, uh, it really is just outdated. Like, it's stuff that we thought, like, like so many people, like, I prescribed to it. I thought that's how dogs built relationships and they were trying to dominate. And for many, many years, that's what I believed. Um, Same. And then, yeah, and then I, then I studied. Um, and there's so many trainers out there, like, still training this. And when you ask them, like, what are your qualifications, their normal response is, I've done this for many years. Um, that's not a qualification, like any other profession in the world. Like, if you've got an interest in it, you've got to study it so that you can't do it. Just because you've done it for years doesn't mean you're an expert. I've had teeth for fucking years. It doesn't make me a dentist. Well, yeah, that and, you know, if imagine you went to see, you know, a psychologist was, that was still using the old school lobotomies or, yeah. you know, shock therapy against your will, you, you'd go, hang on a minute, that, we don't use that anymore. It's science has changed. Our understanding has changed. You know, we really, in the last 10, 15 years, we've really started to look into the minds of dogs and how they really function, you know, they're not. Yeah. Sorry, that's not that's not a wolf, for one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah. I, and like without all jokes aside, all jokes aside, like that's exactly right. They are fifteen to twenty thousand years removed from wolves, and the study that brought dominance theory around was a study done on wolves that were brought together, put in a captive environment, and then observed their behavior. And they watched the linear hierarchy evolve. Well, it turns out when you put a bunch of strangers in a, in a confined place of any species with limited resources, you will see that the sort of shit evolve. But that's not how it should not be applied to dogs. It, it's been disproven on wolves. Um, and so... Yeah, to apply that logic to our domestic dog is so fundamentally flawed. But we've, we've got heaps of reasons to why it's flawed. So we're going to go and pack some of them today. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the word you just used there, our domesticated dogs. We domesticated them or they ended up in 
the backyards of villages and, you know, it was a, a symbiotic relationship of, you know, we threw the rubbish out, they ate, so that was great. And then humans went, huh, you've got traits that I think I could use that are really useful, like hunting and guarding and herding. So we took these traits and selectively bred what we now see today. We selectively bred what we see today. Wolves didn't. And we breed them, we take them out of their litters and then we use them for the different uses that we sometimes still do. So we still have herding breeds, um, some people still have guarding breeds, some still have um, your gun dogs. They are not wolves. If they Where'd you go? Oh, we're here. We're here. Oh. It's just a bit, a bit late. But that's right. They are behaviorally, physically, psychologically, and socially different to wolves. Um, and so, even if it was applicable, which it's not to wolves, it shouldn't be applied to our dogs. Um, mm. Now, what, what we're saying is, so any, but I will say it. Like I'm saying, anybody that says that the problem behavior is caused by dominance is categorically wrong, <laughs> right? It, it's just not what causes unwanted behaviours. Um, it doesn't mean that dominance doesn't exist, right? Dominance, no. by definition, exists. Like, by definition, we are the dominant species because we control almost every aspect of our dog's life, where they live, when they eat, where they go, what, what they have access to, what they don't have access to. So by definition, we're dominant. And yep. we shouldn't need to keep trying to prove it. And the dogs, the dogs aren't trying to claim that status back. <sighs> no, I mean, and if they were, then they'd be opening the fridge. They would decide what they want to eat, where they want to sleep. And they would do that in really, really aggressive ways. A dog leaning against you or trying to sit on the couch, like Frankie here, he's trying to dominate me because he's putting himself at a level that is apparently up to you. Can you see what's going on here? The battle of wills. <laughs> <Yeah>. Exactly. Like, <laughs> and I think he's winning. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean... The, the notion that dogs are constantly trying to dominate us is ridiculous. Like, there is situational dominance, which creates a flexible hierarchy rather than a linear hierarchy. So, like, whoever dominates the situation, by definition, dominated the situation. So, if it was a ball and so one of the dogs walks away with the ball rather than the other dog, by that logic he dominated that situation but it changes like in life like i'll dominate like in, in this very moment i'm dominating the conversation but as soon as i shut up and let you talk you'll be dominating the conversation it's flexible it's situational and it comes down to how much the individual values that resource at the time it's yeah. not a personality no and i think that's the problem outside well no the the, the problem is the label of domin dominance that's consistently used um, gives us no information about why the behaviour is happening, labels that dog as if, well, that's it, you know, the dog's dominant. So if, if Arch had a cow's hoof and Frankie walked up to him and Arch growled at him and Frankie moved away, that's Archie communicating, saying no, and Frankie's going, you do, you do it. But if I turned around and said, oh, my God, Archie's such a dominant dog, then it would mean that in every aspect of his life he's dominant. He's not. He's communicating to, to Frankie, no, this is mine, mate, and all he has to do is go, Ur. Frank goes, I'm good. Yeah. But that label then, that label then just, it spreads everywhere. You know, my uh, my dog's dominant, and you see it all the time on on social media, which like then you know people. Just go, oh yeah. In that in that moment, you know, like, yes, by definition, Archie dominated the conversation, but that's not what caused the problem. 
the problem That's laid true. elsewhere. Like, why did Archie feel the need for the cowhoof so much that he was prepared to get into conflict over it? That's an issue. Mm. You know, like, yeah. what? what's the previous relationship? How, how much has the dog practiced growling as an effective means of communicating? Not because he's dominant, but because he's found it effective. And, and in that case, how many times has he been, has he been compromised? to be forced yeah. to com communicate that way. Yeah, so yeah. it's like any any construct like dominance and aggression and like that, that you can't label any individual with that to brand them. Like that everybody is probably an element of everything uh, at some point in their life. People are passive, people are pushy, people are aggressive, people are subtle. And it's not, a personality trait isn't a reason why a problem behavior happens. So again, just trying to clarify that for people when they're looking at like, for professional advice, like it's, it's, you can't rely on, like it's even like, even to the level, like, okay, the problem behavior didn't lie in the fact that your dog was anxious. You know, your dog is anxious mm. for a reason. It, it's, yeah. It works on the same level. Well, it's yeah. Again, as I said, it's like when you put it when you put a label on something, whether it's a dog or a human or anything else. If you say aggressive, that then stops the conversation. No one's then going. To, no, very few people go. But why? Mm. It's just oh yeah. god, aggressive. Or you know, I met this guy Ian, and he's such an asshole. And people are like, oh really? Very few people would go. Really? Why would you say that? It's just I've made that statement here's the label, and then people are going to create their own stories in their head of what I mean by calling you an asshole. Sorry, mate. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the first time. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, like, the language that we use around dogs, though, uh, and our interactions and relationships around dogs is so important because this whole they're trying to dominate thing, it creates an us and their attitude, which really pushes the almost validates in some ways like the use of correction and force because if people feel offended by what their dog is doing then it can be a pretty strong motivator to get somebody to use quite harsh techniques and a methodology to change behavior it's when you start breaking down like all right well what why is why is your dog that way um, then we can start to really consider like the dog's perspective, and that's relatable as a, as, a, as a person, as a client, like as a as a dog owner. I go through my own emotional experience, and your dog is too. And what we're trying to get people to do is really understand, like, okay, if you feel that hard push to assert yourself that much, you probably felt compromised in some way. And yeah, um, go on. Yeah, you're right. It's it. They do. It gives them a justification to use that particular type of punishment, correction. Um, but why do we feel we need to get to that point? Yeah. Like, why yeah. is it that you know these sorts of things, like picking your dog up and pinning it? Why? I mean, why, why would you first? If, if you think if you've got this, it, it, it's it's a it's a confusing one and really frustrating. So, if you go off and you start off with, and I used to, you know, believe in all the dominance theory and used to check chain until I saw the dog who just went, "I hate you. I'm so frightened." Um, but for people who just continue to think it's okay, why would you bring in an animal in to your home that you already think you're going to have to compete with, and that you are going yeah. to have to get physical with? So that's that's yeah. something that sort of pops up in my head. If you're you're taking you're taking this animal from its family or from a rescue or wherever you might be getting your dog from, you are then not knock on your on your door and going, hey, so can I live here? We take them by our choice, our decision, and then we feel the need to have this ego competition i suppose from the human's perspective of yeah okay well who's who's the alpha here what what how how does that to me sort of the logic doesn't work in my head no like if, when we're training dogs we shouldn't be trying to win like, it's, no, uh, it's not a competition 
it's behavior. It's um, the dog, the dog behavior. And this is something I see a lot with like people that will use dominance as a method of training. Like their language is a bit conflicting. They'll be the first to tell you, you shouldn't anthropomorphize your dog. But at the same time, they'll almost like hold their dog so accountable, like in a moral sense, like applying this higher cognitive ability to their dogs as if it's got a human's cognitive level by like yeah. behaviors like staring staring it down to prove that it or pinning it down to prove that it's an alpha so that as if it's some sort of fucking psychic and it just doesn't make sense to me like if like, if you're gonna have to bring an animal into your home that you if you bring an animal into your home that you think you're gonna have to compete with bully into submission you need to consider whether you should be bringing that dog into your home oh, absolutely and then and, you know the other word was like well it needs to respect me i would not re yeah. respect a bully i'm not going to respect a bully why on earth should we think that bullying an animal that did not come to us by choice is going to earn that respect or force that respect and you can see that with some how some of these dogs move around some of these uh, some people who use those um, types of methods whether they believe that that that's right or not um, you can yeah you can see the difference in the dog's behavior yeah. the no the notion that dogs were ever trying to disrespect anyone is the one that's laughable for me like <laughs> their behavior is based on how they feel it's not about trying to influence our emotions it's not they're not there trying to make us feel belittled and embarrassed or anything like that it's when you're a dog owner or an animal uh caregiver you you need to take that ego out of it you really need to make sure that you're there caring for your animal's needs regardless of how his behavior makes you feel because ultimately like you're its caregiver like you said like you, they didn't choose to be in the situation they that you put them in and if the yeah. situation is wrong change it don't keep putting them in there to then bully them into comply to your methodology and then calling them dominant and stubborn because of your own big-headedness but then it but then that's for people to the, to do that, they have to be empathetic towards the feelings of the animal that's in front of them or just the fact that they have a living being in front of them yes. and look at them and go, are you okay? You okay, Frank? You all right? <laughs> Rather than going, you're not doing what I want you to. And I think it's, I think sometimes that when people think they've trained something to a dog and the dog doesn't do it, I think there's there's outside of that level of frustration I think that they, they, they feel guilty but angry. Like there yeah. is that. You know this. I know. So they feel like the dog is, is belittling them because I trained this to you so you should know this. Don't make me look like an idiot. Yeah. Because when, yeah. when you see a dog running off and the owner's calling them and then the dog eventually comes back and the owner gets angry at the dog, it's like dog's just doing dog things. Mm. If it doesn't come back to you when you're yelling and screaming at it, you might well just want to have a stop and think about it. Yeah. I think that's a really, like you touched on something there that I had this, I had a really cool conversation earlier with uh, one of my team. And she was saying to me about, like when somebody uh, like gets frustrated and corrects their dog, right? Nine times out of 10, they're not doing it to try and dominate the dog. They're doing it because they're angry, right? They're, yep. they're actually just angry at what happened and they or what they didn't know. happen exactly and and they 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 know that losing their shit is probably not the best thing to do but if they're convinced the dominant dominance theory exists then they're going to start labeling themselves stubborn and really then it really feeds in back into that narrative of like i've got to win this but yep on the flip side of it, and this is going to be a little bit controversial, like the, the, the whole force-free movement, the bit where you can't say no to your dog, it almost makes the person that gets angry at their dog, it makes them feel so bad as if like that's just not allowed. Like you're not allowed to have negative emotions about your dog, which is also very, very unhealthy. 
like in no way shape or form are we saying here like you can't like step in and like come on mate like, come and do this other behavior but you do it in a manner that like isn't there to try and belittle them isn't there to try and dominate them it's there to go like just standard running social interference on your family members and friends and going yeah mate i prefer it if you didn't do that when i step in i don't yeah. want to cause fear intimidation or pain but i do want you to go and do this instead and it's got to be the yeah. it's got to be a happy middle ground in there somewhere. yeah it's it does i mean the yeah the the the, the the argument the constant argument and the different camps that that you know people are in we're all in um it can be quite confusing for people it's like well, you know i don't i don't want to use aversives but you know i can't always be positive i don't so i don't know what to do and so they get really confused about it so it it's it is finding a happy medium but yeah you know it is like i don't i don't hit archie can you imagine if i hit this dog <laughs> Even this one. Um, but it's, like, you know, if he, if he doesn't do something that I, I think I've trained him and he doesn't do it, then I have to go back and go, well, hang on, why? What what fell apart in that in that story there where I can go, okay, he's not, he's not coming when I call him and he's got his nose up the back end of, you know, a dog that I know that he's uncomfortable with. If he's not coming, then I have to do something to get him out of that situation. Um, I'm not mm. going to yank him. I don't use a shock collar. But as you said, I will go in and go, come on, mate. If, if we're just going to go over this way um, yeah, without causing it, a bit of a fuss. Yeah, um, that's it. Like if I, I really enjoyed uh, Susan Friedman's t take on this. Like dog training used to be a monologue where you – we used to dictate, and if the dog didn't do it, we correct. Whereas what we've learned is to see that more as a dialogue these days. So if I if I cue the dog to do something and he doesn't do it, that's information for me to go, all right, why? What can I do as a handler to be a, to make this to get the more desirable behavior out of you? I have to assess my environment. I have to assess like. Have I trained it enough? Have I am I using something to motivate the dog enough? Is there something around that's really pressing and making sure that he's not going to do that behaviour because he's uncomfortable? Is he in pain? You know, all of these things are part of this conversation that we shouldn't be just dictating and dominating our dogs. We just need to we need to we need to guide them through life, but we also need to give them a voice as well. Yeah, and it is it's like it it's it is dialogue. It's a conversation. It's like how are you? What do you need in this situation now? Can I help you with that need? Can I <clears throat> direct you in the way that is best suited to this particular situation? Because our expectations of dogs in our current situations these days is so high. It's dogs are just not allowed to be dogs. Mm. You know, we put them in, in urban environments. We put them out on, you know, teeny tiny balconies. Um, People don't engage with their dogs anymore. They don't let them sniff anymore. They just kind of drag them along, go to the park and throw the chucket for 20 minutes, then go home. Like there's the difference between how dogs live in our life now and how dogs lived in our lives 30 years ago in my lifetime where mm. dogs were still slightly free roaming, you know. They'd come in, they'd get a meal, they'd go off, they'd do their thing where now they are confined to our homes and they are under our mm. strict guidelines and routines of you will do this now and you will do this and you will do this and no, you can't do this and no, you can't do that. No, you... Can you imagine? It would be like being held hostage all the time. Like I, what What do I do now? Am I allowed to do this? Yeah. Look at and then we put you know, all the... As soon as anybody's uh, restriction... Well, look at everybody's behaviour with... Uh current restrictions coming in from like the government right now like, everybody's so frustrated everybody's so underlying level of tension has gone up through the roof um because we've been restrained and yet we ask our dogs to live this way all the time and when they don't comply we've got to we've really got to make sure that we get understand and look into that why because again like that the, the language around it, like 
what success looks like as a trainer needs to be assessed because getting successful training results get the dog to comply in my book isn't always a successful session because trainers that will go oh well, like just base my just base my results base your judgment on my my results like great if you're really good at getting dogs to comply using force then that ain't a good trainer in my book that's a bully um yeah like part of the dialogue we have to have at the start of a lot of consultations is around making sure that the client really understands what success looks like and that might be nothing like the preconceived idea that the client had and that's the reality of it and that's what we're up against um when we're working with dogs looking through with looking at it through that empathetic lens well yeah and it is it's you know your success is really based on how, how is the dog you know this if if you if you can only work with a dog by manhandling it, to me that's not a skill. It's really not a skill. Anyone can manhandle a dog, and if the dog doesn't comply, you just intensify. That's not a skill. I'm sorry, it's just not. As you yeah. said, you're a bully. A yeah. skill is being able to work with the animal and seeing that progression that's solid, setting that solid foundation that the dog can do obviously the cues if you're working with cues that your, your dog sees the cue and goes yeah i know what you mean awesome or you put the dog in the situation it goes yep the environment's giving me information and i understand it and i know what to do and the dog's happy that's a skill that's yes. some that's that's how, that's how we should be you know you don't see even the zoo environment now the zoo environment they're not going into lions and pinning them down Although, if you did and you got out alive, I'd probably shake your hand. Wouldn't think you were skilled, but I'd shake your hand. That'd just be luck. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, fucking lucky. Like, that's it. Like, the, the training methods that it almost condones, like, with the correction tools and what have you. Like, for me, name another species on Earth that if it was filmed and put on Instagram, it wouldn't be called abuse. <laughs> it's uh, it's ridiculous. Like no, man, you're mm -hmm. absolutely torturing that animal. Um, but in a nutshell, look, we're going to sum this up in uh, a couple of minutes because we've we've hit that nice half hour mark. Um, that went fast. Wow, so quickly. Uh, it yeah, it did a bit. Um, can we just can we scoot, just scoot on corrections first? Because someone's put up a post. The most frustrating one is where people think their dog is trying to be dominant over us by walking through the door first. So some of the, the weird things, like, uh, yeah, uh, you can wrap it up. I'm sorry. We have to end on some of the weird, the weird things that people have been told and people that I've worked with that have been told this and have done it. Okay. Eat out of your dog's bowl. Yeah. Pee on your dog. That's oh. gold. I love this. So, so I've, I've had a few of these over the years. Um, I'm so happy to not wrap this up and go into this. My favourites are, yeah, going through doors. As if dogs know what bloody doors are. They're a man-made invention. My, another one is when they walk ahead of you. Like, what happens every time somebody lets their dog off leave? Is it all of a sudden a fucking alpha? <laughs> no. I've... I've, I've seen people not let their dogs have anything above uh, to lay on above floor level because they must always be higher. How short are these people? Like, <laughs> well, me, <laughs> it just doesn't add up to me. And like the notion that dogs have got this higher cognitive, cognitive ability to go, okay. If this guy consistently goes through doors before me, so he must be the <laughs> dominant one. And it's just ridiculous. I'm sorry. Have you ever walked to a closed door with your dog and stood there and looked at your dog going, can't go anywhere? How much more dominant could you be? We have thumbs. <laughs> So do you, Sophie's come up with 
from like uh, from So Help Me Dog. She's come up with a couple of good ones, like seen ones, right? Where she had a client once get home and every day pick the dog up, uh, stand on the sofa and go, I'm more dominant than you. And then put it down because that's what a trainer told her to do. Um, wow. I've had, I've had a client be told in the past that he's got a pee all over his dog's food bowls so that the dog knows that they actually belong to him. Um, oh, dear God. I've had, I've had clients be told to bite their dog back because they need to know that you will because the dominant one won't back down. Same with staring. Like, we... Staring, like you've got to win the stare. Don't break a stare with a dog. Like, what a fucking notion. Like, we know that staring, staring, like holding eye contact is weird and intense. And if your dog is staring at you, tell me you ain't done the crush. <laughs> well, that's yeah. I mean, I had someone who, yeah, they got a new puppy and the puppy was going through the mouth stage and she was told, bite it, bite it back. So she bit it on the ear. <laughs> It's literally laughable. I, I, I remember. I remember when I believed in dominance theory, and I remember the moment that the light bulb went off. And I did not want this to be the case, but I realised that I had been wrong for a long time. And now it's a, now it is literally laughable. Like I've got I've gone to the point where I'm like, okay, I was so fucking wrong. But I didn't like it at the start. Like, I, I remember being challenged at first and getting my back up and getting all argy about it. But you can't argue with science because science is ever evolving. But it's even outside of just arguing with science. I remember the the day that I went, nah, this is, this is wrong. Um, and it was before I started studying to, to work with dogs. Um, it was just the look that this dog looked at me at. Yeah. Like it wasn't, you know, when I go to see him in his, in his kennel at the shelter, he was like, hey. And then, you know, I'd put the check chain on and I was being advised by a trainer there who was like, yep, you've got to put the check chain on. Big American bulldog, yep, put the check chain on. Because he wouldn't walk. This dog just was petrified. And I just remember I pulled it and he just cowered down again and I couldn't pull it again. I was like, I'm no, nah, I'm out. There has to like there has to be something else. Because this yeah. dog was saying to me, No way, lady. And this dog weighed not much less than I did. And well, he that, was that, on that, the ground. That, nah. that brings us on to like so a slightly different point. But I, I agree. Like I remember that time when I used to use correction and just realised that I, I wasn't actually being an advocate for my dog. But you mentioned there, like, the big American bulldog. Like, the notion that these breeds, some breeds are more dominant than others, again, is a load of shit. Like, it's not, it's not a fucking breed thing. It's, it's not even a personality trait. It's, like, so for example, let's just take, I've had Rottweilers in the past. I love Rotties. Typically, like, they get branded by the old school as this dominant breed that you've got to have a firm hand with. Like, Rottweilers were bred to be really sensitive to change in their environment, but then when they get when they get unsettled, they use what they've got what they've got to communicate how they feel about it, which is be loud, be big. But that is a response to stress because we bred a real sensitive dog. You don't you need to be careful with a Rottweiler that you're not going to try and dominate it and then cause so many problems because these dogs are so sensitive. And I'm, I'm just plucking one breed out here, but I know how sensitive Ronnie's are. I've had them. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, this, you know, this notion that the bigger the dog, the more force you have to use with it. Again, I bring back a lion. I really want to see someone use force with a lion. If you think just because it's a bigger, a bigger animal or even a cat, like, can you imagine doing, trying some of what people do with cats? You'd be face would be in ribbons. It's just you have an animal, a sentient, thinking, feeling oh. being. You have to acknowledge that and go, here we are today. How oh. are you? How are you, Archie? 
He's feeling left out, I think, because Frank took, took centre stage. Um, Not in his usual position. Who are you? What do you need? How can I facilitate that? Absolutely. And then see what you get. You know, the what I've said for you is behaviour is information, and if you don't take that information, you're doing yourself and your dog a massive disservice, and it's going to come out in the end. And then just letting your dog dominant just because you have not taken the time to take a step back and gone, who are you? Then that's that's on you. Yeah. Who are you and why are you communicating that way? How can I meet your fundamental needs and how can we resolve this without... <laughs> yeah. Like, like any reasonable being. And if, you, if you're getting a big dog, knowing that you're going to try to bully it into submission, you need to reassess whether or not you should be a big trainer. Because if you don't have the skill set, control and keep safe, keep the public safe and keep, the, keep everything in line without using fear, force and intimidation, you ain't equipped. No. And it's, it's, it's not fair to the animal. It's a relationship that, that you have to build trust. You don't, you don't get respect. I don't just respect people. I respect them for particular things that they do. Absolutely. Well, that's that's it. Like you know, one thing I haven't we well, we haven't said yet is you know if they don't build relationships based on linear hierarchy, what do they do? And it's based on trust. And trust is earned. You do not earn trust by trying to dominate. Um, you want to. We want people to take responsibility for their dogs, where they put their dogs, and take responsibility for their dog's behavior, which takes, the, it means that you take the role of, well, you take the role of the dominant one in the, in the family, regardless. Yes. But it doesn't mean that you should try to dominate your dog through force. And if you notice your dog's behavior is what you deem inappropriate, you need to know why, and what is the emotional experience, what is it like, and what can I do to make sure that this doesn't happen in the long run? Yeah, it's, 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 building a, um, it's, it's building a relationship over time. And if you people need to acknowledge the responsibility of having a dog, mm. acknowledge, yeah. accept, and own it, rather than just going, I have a dog. That's not the end of it. It's I have a dog and ABCD. Absolutely. And like, the, like, if you get a good trainer, you will find emotional support because it's emotionally challenging to live with a dog that has got behavior issues. Whereas, yeah. unfortunately, we see dominance trainers basically put it back on the owner and go, you're just not dominant enough. You're not being assertive enough. You're, you're not meeting, like, your dog. You're not providing a strong enough leadership for your dog. But that doesn't help anybody but struggle. And no, and then, and then you know, then it's, um, you can't do it, so send it out to my board and train and I'll fix it in a week or two. Yeah, yeah, it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a bloody car that you just fix. Like, yeah. It's it. But then, you know, even using the, that word fixing, that's yeah. insinuating that the dog's broken. They're not broken. Yeah. They yeah. just need some help. That's you know, nice. just like us at times. Not broken. Yeah. We might just be struggling with something and we just need someone to just give us a little bit of help and a little bit of guidance and some empathy to go, all right, you're not okay. How can I, how can I help you be okay? Yeah, that's it. And like, we're so, we've got to be, we're, we're so judgmental of behavior. But at the end of the day, if you see somebody struggling, dog, human, any species, we, we should be taking the time to understand like what is going on behind the scenes there rather than just branding them a wanker or dominant. Well, I mean, you know, we have Are You OK Day in Australia and around the world. You know, why can't we have the same thing for dogs, you know? And this, again, this, this is... This Every is day, not just one day. Yeah. Well, that, that, day. That, that is, that's why we're going to have to keep plugging this is because it is a, 
culture shift that's going to happen and take time. That the mentality of how people perceive mental health in humans uh, and people, let alone their dogs, is only just really developing. And we're so, me and you are so fortunate to live in a culture that it's becoming more and more normalized to for your behavior to be considered uh, as, you know, in, in the way that it's starting to be. And, but that, that's not necessarily the case across the world. So that, that is a reality of the challenge that's in front of us. But again, I don't, that's why we're not shying away from it. And that's why we do things like today. Hallelujah. Oh. Right. <laughs> right. Second attempt at wrapping it up on the um, okay. final notes. Dominance doesn't cause behavior. Be careful of anybody that actually states that. If they say to you that they're not qualified, but they've got a lot of experience, brilliant. You can, te- you can offer to do dental work on them based on the fact that you've got teeth. And, um, what else is that? Um, yeah, dominance is not, is, is not a personality. It's not a blanket personality. So he, I'm being dominated by my dog, as you can see. <laughs> exactly. Must pin him down now. <laughs> oh, two of them. Two of them. Oh, my God, I'm being dominated. No. <laughs> um, yeah, dominance is not a personality trait. If, if your dog's doing something... Ask the question why. Like we need to start asking questions again, not just label them and then expect that, well, that's it. Like why? 100%. (laughs) (laughs) Cheeky. Oh, okay. Well, in my own house, I'm going to go and be dominated by my dogs. Have fun. Right. Thanks, mate. That was great. Bye, everyone. See ya.